you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 20 through 23. If you don't mind standing with me for the reading of the Word of God, as custom here. Thank you to everybody who helped put on the Christmas concert two weeks ago and was involved in that. It was a massive success. Thank you so, so very much for, for everything that you did um, and everything in the Christmas season. It's, it, was a, it was a great time around here. A lot of fast and furious things were happening at Westchester Church. December kind of shapes up that way. But thank you so much for um, jumping on board for the ride. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 through 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go speedily. I like that. Let us go speedily to pray. Let's go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nation, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you. We will go with you. For we have heard. We're going to go with you. And this is why we're going to go with you. Because we heard that God is with you. He's saying there's going to be people out of every town, and they're going to find you. And the reason they're going to find you is because they're going to want to go speedily to pray with you. And the reason why is because that somewhere through the grapevine, they heard something. And this is what they heard. God is with you. So let us go speedily, for we have heard. Let us go speedily, for we have heard. And you may be seated. One afternoon, on April the 18th, 1775, a young boy who worked at a stable in Boston overheard British officers say one to the no- another something along the lines of, heck, we'll be paid tomorrow. That's not the book that I got this story out of, did not use the word heck, but I'm using the word heck. The stable boy ran the news to Boston's north end to the home of a silversmith by the name of Paul Revere. Revere listened intensely. This was not the first rumor that he had heard that day. Earlier, he had been told an unusual number of British officers had gathered at Boston's long wharf in silence. That afternoon wore on, Revere became more and more convinced that the British were about to make a major move that had been rumored, and two men began to carry this very urgent message. The first man, by the name of Paul Revere, would ride north, and the second man, by the name of William Dawes, set out to ride south. Both men, at the same exact time, with an urgent message, carrying the identical message, the British are coming. The British are coming. Paul Revere's ride is perhaps the most famous historical example of a word-of-mouth epidemic. The piece of extraordinary news traveled long distances in short time and mobilized an entire region, the news spread like a virus as those informed by Paul Revere sent out riders of their own until alarms would go off through the entire region. The word in Lincoln, Massachusetts at 1 a.m., Subbury in 3 a.m., and over 40 miles north of Boston, 5 a.m. At 9 a.m., it had reached as far west as Ashby near Warsaw. And when the British finally began their march toward Lexington on the morning of the 19th, The countryside was met to their utter astonishment with an organized and fierce resistance. William Dawes, on the other hand, 
carried the, ex- the identical message, worked his way through Lexing- to we- Lexington, through just as many towns over the same exact period of time, but nobody moved. The local militia leaders were not alarmed. In fact, one town, Waltham, so few men fought the following day that historians debate on whether it was a pro-British town or not. It wasn't. The people just didn't find out until it was too late. It leads us to believe that if it were the news only, if the only thing that mattered was the message, then Dawes would just be as famous as Paul Revere. But he's not. So why did one succeed and one fail? Why is one known and one is not? The most important issue in the world is the salvation of humanity. This should be the priority of every single individual in this room is the salvation of the souls of mankind. Numerous other things will strive to take precedent over this singular issue. And since the day of Pentecost, the message of salvation has been preached in every language. It's been preached on every continent. It's been preached for every generation. The same message that Peter preached whenever he rose up and he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This same exact message has been preached. But the question I propose is why has some been as revered and set the countryside ablaze with this message? And some, like dolls, fail to mobilize anybody with the message. Why has some been successful with the same exact message? And why has some failed with the same exact message? And what do we need to do to ensure that we succeed with the message that we've been given? You can have a cure to cancer, but if nobody listens to you, it doesn't do anybody any good. You can have the greatest message in the entire world, but if nobody listens, it doesn't do anyone any good. The enemy can be knocking on your doorstep, and you can tell everybody about it, but if nobody listens, it just falls on deaf ears, and everything is overtaken. Before Revere rode on that legendary night, he was already known for his acts of service. When Boston imported its first streetlights, Revere served on the committee to make it happen. When the Boston market required regulations, Revere was the clerk. He founded the Massachusetts Mutual Fire Insurance Company after the major city was burned to the ground in a fire. He served in over 100 different capacities in his life in his community. Try putting all of those things on a headstone. The guy was involved. The guy made a mark in his community before he was ever needed in his community. It was not surprising then that when the British Army began its secret campaign in 1774 to root out and destroy the arms and ammunition held by the revolutionary movement that Revere became the kind of unofficial clearinghouse for any anti-British forces because Revere knew everybody. He was the logical one that if you were a stable boy on an afternoon in April the 18th, 1775, and overheard two British officers speaking, he was the one you would go to. Here then is the explanation for why his ride of a word-of-mouth epidemic enraged the, the countryside and why William Dawes did not. It's simply this. Paul Revere was one who knew how to connect with people. Paul Revere was a connector. When he died, his funeral was attended in the ones of one newspaper account by troops of people. 
He was a fisherman, a hunter, a card player, a theater lover, a successful businessman. He was act, active in, in, in several clubs in his community. He was a doer, a man with an uncanny genius for being at the center of all of the events. And when the moment arose to change the course of history, he was able to do so because he spent his life simply connecting with the people around him. Simply connecting with the people around him. This is the same exact reason. This is the same exact reason why Jesus came. In Luke chapter 19 and 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He can't, God himself came to the conclusion, I can't save you from heaven. I have to actually come to where you are. Matthew 20 and 28, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. In Luke 5 and 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. John 12 and 47, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus stayed connected to the world. And here's what I want you to realize. You can't change what you're not connected to. You cannot change what you're not connected to. If there is no connection, there is no chance that you'll be able to change it. You can only change what you're connected to. If we make, if we will make a difference in our world, if we plan on making a difference in our neighborhoods, if we plan on making a difference in the lives of the people around us, we have to stay connected. Jesus stayed connected to his mission, and he con stayed connected to the subject of his mission. In Luke 4 and 18, he begins to, to display this. Hey, Joshua. Welcome home. Can I borrow you a second? Come see me. He didn't just stay connected to his mission. He stayed connected to the subject of his mission. Daniel, can you come help me? I need both of you tonight. In Luke 4 and 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. All right, Daniel, come on this side. Hey, you know what? Y'all can step up here. Right here. He hath anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. In other words, Jesus had to stay connected. In order, in order to do this, in order to preach the gospel to the poor, you have to be connected to two things. You have to be connected to the gospel, and you have to be connected to the poor. See, a lot of times, the, the, the longer that you're in church, the more you love the gospel. And it's like, oh, I've got the gospel, this is all I need. And we forget that there's a reason why the gospel is in our life. It's not in our lives for us to soak in and fall in love with, even though we should fall in love with it. Whenever Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus' response was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, upon these two things hang all of the laws and of all the prophets. So he was saying, hey, you have to stay connected to the gospel. But you also have to stay connected to the poor. And he said, this is what I was anointed for. I was anointed to be connected to the gospel. And I was anointed to be connected to the poor all at the same time. And then he says, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. We like healing. I believe you're my healer. I believe you are all I need. Oh, they're sick. Let's stay away from them. I believe you're my portion. Oh, they've, they've got like a lot of sin over here. We're going to stay away from the sin factor. 
There's too much brokenness over there. There's too many broken pieces over there. There's too much heartache over there. If I get connected to that, then I might get dirty. If I get connected to that over there, then, eh, yeah, no, I like kind of how my life is. My life is nice and pretty and, not, and neat and everything, but that's all messy. And if I go messy, then, uh, well, what, what's, what's this going to think if that I get involved over there? But here's the thing. You, you, you have to hold on to this. Because you have to stay connected to the one who heals broken hearts in order to bring healing to the broken heart. He said, my mission, he sent me to heal the broken hearted. And we, you have to stay, you cannot heal something you're not connected to. So you have to stay connected to the source and you have to reach something that needs the source. But here's the problem a lot of times. Whenever you're connected, and whenever you're reaching for things and you're reaching for people and you're reaching for the broken, you're reaching for the bruised, you're reaching for the busted people of life, the, the gospel is solid. It's not changing. It's not moving. It's anchored. It, where it is is where it is. It's not moving. But people are constantly moving. People are constantly changing. People are constantly walking away. So I want you to begin to walk that way. You stay put. And so a lot of times, the struggle is trying to connect something that's so far away and staying connected over here. And there begins to be a tension in yourself and you feel like Jesus. And maybe that's why Paul wrote whenever he said the word, that I may know him. In the power of his resurrection. The power of the connection and in the fellowship of his suffering. Because there's nothing more suffering than trying to reach for something or reach for somebody that's so far from God. And you are the only thing, you are the only glue that's holding it together. And the goal is to eventually step by step. And it's hard and it's not easy to connect the two. But can I tell you what happens whenever you begin to reach in such a way that it be, keep I want you to keep pulling. Where you begin to lose grip, but you're trying to hold on to what you see. I'm about to let you go. Okay? I'm about to let you go. Whenever stay there. Whenever the grip, whenever the tension becomes so great that you don't feel like you can hang on to the person and to your, to your gospel at the same time, let go of the person. Come back over here. Get another great grip. Strip up. Anchor yourself. And then go reach again. Connect again. Because you're anointed to bring healing to the brokenhearted. And, he's, and to preach. You can't bring healing to anything if you're not connected to the source. So you do everything in your power to stay connected to the source. And it says to preach deliverance to the captives. Uh, the one to preach deliverance to the captives. Uh, I cannot I cannot free anybody. I cannot deliver anybody. I can't deliver you from addiction. I can't deliver you from bad relationships. I can't deliver you from bad mistakes, but Jesus can. Therefore, what we do is we connect to Jesus, and we connect, and we say, you know what, I'm going to be the conduit in which Jesus can flow. I'll be the one in which Jesus can, can move through. I'm going to be the one that's going to preach deliverance, and if I don't have a message to preach that I can't reach, that's why we have to stay connected. He said, a recovering of sight to the blind. I can't make anybody physically see that's never seen before. And I can't make anybody spiritually see that's never spiritually seen before. But I know who can. I know Jesus can. And since I believe Jesus can, I stay connected to Jesus. And then I reach. And I reach. And set at liberty those who are bruised. The ones that are busted and bruised. We have to stay connected to both. And we have to allow the tension because it's kind of like a rubber band. The more you stretch it, the further it reaches. The more you stretch it, the further it goes. And then eventually, over time, the more you stay connected. Remember, this isn't moving. The more relationships you build, whenever that moment comes, whenever you're, the British are coming, no offense to all of our British connections in here. You're, you're awesome. 
But the moment it comes where you need to make a difference in someone's world, you've been there with them in the worst times. You've been there with them in the broken times. You've been that shoulder to cry on. And whenever they finally get to a point where they're tired of pulling and they're tired of stretching, there comes a point where they take a step of faith. There's going to come a point where they say, you know what? Where do I go to whenever I need help? Where do I turn? When it, who was there for me whenever I was broken? It was the person who was connected. And then all of a sudden, the, 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 you, you get to bring those together and say, you know what? Who else can I reach? Who else can I fight for? And then they began to go. Because what made Paul Revere successful, he, was, he connected with the people who he had personally connected with. And after he had connected with them, they sent out the people that they were connected with. And the entire country was mobilized. And one year later, they got to sign a declaration of independence. But it all started with a stable boy who knew, where can I go with the information that I have? I'm going to go to Paul Revere. Who are you connected to? Thank you, guys. Who are you connected with? Who are you influencing? Whose lives are you changing? Who are you going to connect with in 2020? Who do you have influence with? Are you in this thing for you or are you in this thing for someone else? Let us go speedily. It's the connection that causes people to say, we have heard. Winston Churchill, as the Prime Minister of Great Britain for 10 years, his strength was not his military prowess, but his passion to connect with his people. Across every single memo, that went across the desk of Winston Churchill. He wrote these words, action this day. Action this day. Alexander the Great was asked how he totally conquered his world. He said, by not delaying. By not delaying. Let us go speedily. And in 1776, when the American colonists declared independence, it was held as a victory. But that's not where it began. It began on a very cold spring morning with a word-of-mouth epidemic that spread from a stable boy and, connect, and to a connector on a horse. I believe, I believe that there is a revival in this church. And it will happen because we take the intentional step to not only connect to Jesus, but connect to the world. I believe that there is a connection that God wants to make in your life. And the greatest way to connect, the greatest way to connect, you ready? This is a way that no one will stop you from connecting. Well, I just can't connect with people. I just... The greatest way is to serve others. Serve others. Everybody wants to be served. But who wants to serve? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of of a servant. I made a joke the other night. We were sitting at the dinner table with some friends and I I just said, I'll volunteer for anything. If there's an opportunity in Westchester County, if there's an opportunity somewhere in the New York metro that I can go serve, that I can volunteer, that I can meet somebody new, that I might get a window into somebody else's life for the betterment of the kingdom of God, consider me there. This year in 2020, the theme for Westchester Church is known. We can put up billboards and we're going to do it. We can do all kinds of things to get our name out there, and we're going to do it. 
but the greatest way to be known is to serve. Go above and beyond. Or as one man said, be a two-mile man in a one-mile world. Who will you serve this year? Who are you going to bless this year? Because it's not about you anymore. This church is not here. This church is not here to serve you. This church is here for us to connect with Jesus and connect with someone who needs him and allow ourselves to be stretched to the max. I don't want to go to heaven with any gas left in my tank. I want to use everything I got. I hope that my knees are skin up whenever I get into heaven. I hope that there's scratches on, on my, 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 or calluses on my hands from reaching so hard. I want to give it everything I got. Let us go speedily, for we have heard. Let us go speedily, for we have heard that God is with them. Whenever people come in contact with you, let them say, you know what? Let's, let's go to your church. Because I heard that God was there. When someone needs prayer, let them say, you know what? I bet if I go to Napoleon, God will answer my prayer because God's with him. Whenever somebody's having a family issue, let them, let them think, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go find Kathy because Kathy has a great prayer life and I need somebody to pray. Let's go speedily for we have heard that God is with them. Whenever I'm looking for examples on how to, to raise my family and I want some advice on how to let me go speedily and, and, and find Ryan and Bobby because they've raised kids that know how to love God. Whenever I'm looking for something for an issue in my, because I have an issue in my life, let me go speedily and find somebody. Let me connect to somebody for we have heard we have heard that God is with them. I want it to be said of me. Whenever someone's in a trial, whenever someone's broken hearted, when somebody needs to connect, you know what? God's with them. When the three Hebrew boys, this is, this is one of my favorites, care whenever the three Hebrew boys were thrown into the fire, it was King Nebuchadnezzar that said, I see four. And the fourth is that's the Son of God. It wasn't anybody spiritual that saw Jesus with them. The people that are going to see God in you are not going to be the spiritual ones. It's going to be the Nebuchadnezzars in your life. It's going to be the ones that want to throw you into the fire in your life. It's going to be the ones that have walked away from God. It's amazing. Some of the people that see God the quickest are people who have walked away from God. It's like even though they've walked away, they still know what he looks like. And whenever you stand for truth and you stand for the gospel and you anchor yourself to it, and whenever you're thrown into that fire, whatever they're looking, you know what they're going to say? Oh, God's with them. God is with them. God is with them. You know why we serve? It's because we want to make Jesus known. In a world of self-promotion, we want to promote our Creator. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Let us go speedily, for we have heard.